Good evening. I'm Mark Harris. Uh, welcome to the second episode, season three of Diversa TV. Uh, we'll, today, tonight we're doing um, what we sometimes jokingly refer to as an Anglo perspective, as if there's only one, or a one generic one. But if you're just tuning in to the show for the first time, uh, my name is Mark Harris. Um, I'm... I wear a number of hats uh, besides the host of this show. I'm an ethnic studies professor. I am an alcohol and drug counselor at Lane Community College and uh, most recently have been uh, interim uh, chief diversity officer, which does not empower me to, in fact, write diversity tickets for violations, though sometimes <laughs> I wish I could. Um, but uh, Diversity TV, um, uh, just to give you a glimpse of our mission, if you would go to slide, gentlemen, thank you. To illuminate everyday diversity issues and give the mic and the camera to those who don't always get it. So we started out uh, the show a couple of seasons ago, and seasons correspond with Lane Community College's terms. This isn't a class yet, but we could use it as content eventually. Uh, we start, uh, because we're on Turtle Island, and it's my personal philosophy to always start with the first people, start with a native perspective. Then because we are speaking English, and this is so far a monolingual mono show, we usually do an Anglo perspective as the second. Then Africans in America, uh, Latino, February 13th, Asian, um, February 20th, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, two-spirit. February 27th, disability. March 5th, youth. March 12th, class. March 18th, which will be the last broadcast uh, in our spring, be just before our spring break in our finals week, spirituality and religion. Uh, tonight, we are hosting um, Lynn Marie Chowdhury. Uh, human Resources Analysis for Lane Community College. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing great. We, um, she graciously agreed to come on at the la literally the last minute when our regularly scheduled guest had a family emergency. So uh, our good wishes go out to um, that guest who we will have on at a later date. So what do you do as a Human Resources Analyst? An analyst. As an analyst? Analyst. <laughs> well, my responsibilities are part of a team of people, and that should be clarified first. But primarily what I do is recruitment in my area. And I assist in the hiring practices, policies, and procedures of the college. Okay. Um, that can take the form of assisting an applicant through whatever hiring process where they need. It's assisting committees in developing and forming a a uh, fair and competent hiring process, and it's helping to evaluate and facilitate all of the required compliance pieces as required by our organization and affirmative action. Hmm. So, um, so what does affirmative action compliance look like? I mean, what, what are some of those things? Well, at Lane, that happens at three places in the hiring process. And at each of those places, um, which is we look at the applicant pool, and that's evaluated in line of is this an applicant pool that represents the reasonable recruitment area mm -hmm. that we're in? And if not, an appropriate decision is made by those people who made those decisions, and I facilitate the information to them and provide input where asked. Okay. Then the second level of affirmative action within the process is after the committee has first looked at all, we call it the paper screening process, the initial review. And after they've looked at that, they're going to say, we want to interview X amount of people. Affirmative action then looks at it again. And at this stage of the affirmative action process, we're looking at how are these people scored? 
what was done? How did they determine? And there's a whole quantitative assessment, but then there's a qualitative piece based on looking at the entire hiring package, its mm -hmm. position in the college, and its position in the reasonable recruitment area. Okay. And then the last piece is when a hiring recommendation is made and we've said, we'd like to hire Mark for this job, we're going to look at those same pieces again. And we're going to, as a recruitment team and through the appropriate people in the college, I don't make all of these decisions is what I want to clarify. So sometimes I think I should. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what it comes down to is that when that hiring recommendation is made, we want to ensure that we are in full compliance with the request to make sure underrepresented populations have been treated appropriately within the reasonable recruitment area and within the affirmative action guidelines and policy that the OFCCP administers. Um, this is a college-wide goal. What is that acronym you just used? Oh, I'm sorry. That's it's okay. The off <laughs> it's, oh, now I'm not going to be able to say it. It's the, the Office for um, Compli Contractual Compliance, I believe, and Procedure. Yes. I'm for, and yes. Procedure. And it's an overseeing body, but it, it couples with the EEOC, which is the Equal okay. Opportunity Com community, a commission, and a few other um, agencies. It's a, it's a group picture, and the picture of affirmative action is not one to treat anyone preferentially. It's to make sure people are treated with equality. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that that gets messed up. It's not saying anyone is better or worse. It is a skill-based hire. Mm -hmm. But we must look at if you are equal and the same in skill set, abilities, and knowledge, if you have two people who are the same, we're going to follow those affirmative action policies and recommendations, period. Okay. So, um, yeah, since you, there are a lot of, you, you just threw out a lot oh, of I fertile know. ground there. So why is... Um, I mean, th this might probably be uh, a question aimed at your boss, mm -hmm. but uh, you could a probably answer it from your perspective. Okay, I'll try and to. And I could answer from my various hats, too. With affirmative action under attack, why is Lane Community College still committed to it? You know, I, I only know the humanity part of that answer. Okay is that my, my core belief, and I sternly believe this, is that the Office of Human Resources at this college, our director and the people that lead the college truly believe in this process. They, the belief and the honor that this should be based on skills, abilities, and knowledge, and people should not be moved one way or another because of any other trait or characteristics, belief, whatever it might be. I believe the college believes that. And I think that board, I think that that's firmly held. I can only answer from that perspective. Okay. The humanity of it, they believe it as humans. Okay. Um, because one of the things I do, I mean, you reference, you know, if we were going to hire Mark. So when Mark got hired here, yes. yeah, is it weird to talk to your, about yourself in the third person? Anyway. The royal we. The royal we. The yes, royal we. Yes. When... <laughs> The corporate royal we, Lane Community College, decided to hire Mark 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, this was under um, the guidance of, uh, I guess I can talk about this history because it has been public, publicized at one point, and I did write about it. Mm -hmm. right. So I'm not really revealing any dirty laundry, but I would say you know, at the outset to contextualize this, that Lane Community College is fairly typical for the major employers in this town and in this state in terms of being progressive and not saying that because we do, you know, my paycheck is being paid here, to be blunt mm -hmm. about that. Okay? It is fairly typical. All right? Um, because, so as an example, so I'm a um, faculty. My hire in 1992, there were 44 faculty positions uh, in, in that various search process. Wow. Okay, 44 faculty positions. You know, we were fat city, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for those 44 faculty positions, mm -hmm. we received 1,400 apps, mm -hmm. and uh, 160 of those were minority. Very small percentage. Well, it's 11%. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, I had since kind of done the analysis because the, um, 
first affirmative action officer at the time, uh, Donna Albro, mm -hmm. um, a uh, African American female, Republican. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I forgive her for that. Yeah. I'm not saying a word. Of course, you don't. You, you know. <laughs> yeah, but uh, her 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 approach was basically as you as you were talking about. Um, so she did the analysis, and basically our local hiring area, because you know she she and I had developed a relationship, not because we were the only the bo both black compliance officers in our respective areas. Mine was federal substance abuse, hers was affirmative action, right. and you know our areas do cross, especially if the applicant comes under ADA, right. which uh, this in one particular instance it in fact did. Um, so, but she analyzed my hire and uh, basically uh, presented it to the board in terms of looking at what the issues were. Because Oregon is a largely Anglo state and Eugene is a largely Anglo community, mm -hmm. the impression that people get is that it's hard for minorities to come here or want to come here because there's low minority numbers, right? And that they don't apply and they don't bother to apply, et cetera, et cetera. That is the perception. That is not, in fact, the reality. Because when you're talking about local hiring areas for all positions, mm -hmm. uh, for example, faculty, manager, administrator, mm -hmm. and above, whatever, okay, right. we do national searches. Right, correct. Um, for classified positions, we do local searches, regional. which could be regional, which could be what? Northwest region? What is that region? Um, it's technically, it starts local within the, uh, are you familiar with the term um, market service area from? It's the lane market service area. Okay. So the greater the greater lane area is the first place. But region is also based on the type of position. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes the region might be Oregon. Okay. And for a classified position. Yeah. You know, our job is to create and develop and recruit a qualified applicant pool. Right. The EEOC provides a tool for that. They have a, a tool where you can approach agencies who are working with people of... Um, all different groups that might be covered by affirmative action or ADA. Mm -hmm. And you can contact individual organizations and say, I have this job and we, haven't ha we don't have a qualified pool of applicants. And we can send our postings directly to them. And this is within the Salem area or the Portland area. And, and it's individual search related work to make sure we're doing our job. Mm -hmm. And which to me is another sign that Lane is trying. And, yeah, and, yeah. and I have to bring it back to affirmative action because the thing about affirmative action is that it's not a say yes, say no. It's you are supposed to exercise good faith efforts mm -hmm. in everything you do. Mm -hmm. And I do see good faith efforts with what we do. And I try to enact those. And I think the people I work with in my department do as well. So circling back to that. Yeah. So... Um Within that particular search, then, you know, again, yours. 16 years ago. Right, yours, the good faith mine. effort. So let's see, 11% minorities in the pool, which is actually comparable. Because to our market for, area, yes. To our mar which is national, and with the right. internet, international. Right, now. and it wasn't, it wasn't that time, so that's yeah. not bad. Yeah. Um, so one of the things, if, you know, in terms of when I use that particular example as a teaching tool, Mm -hmm. So if there are no barriers and everybody is qualified, mm -hmm. then you could expect that if 11% applied, you might eliminate a couple of percentage points in terms of you know, not meeting the minimums or whatever, but you would expect a certain percentage of those to move in to be considered for uh, uh, either employment or search committees or whatever, right? So, okay. so 10% of 44, of course, is four, right? right? So out of, you know, for 44 positions, you might have expected a you know, proportional amount of four of those being minority. Okay. Right? They hired me. We're glad. Yeah. <laughs> so the question then arises because, you know, my students will ask this, well, wait a minute. So I said, so look at that. So out of 160 minority applicants, what are the chances that only one was qualified? Well, the numbers, the qualitative numbers actually give us the analysis of that. Right. right? Okay. 
So the federal standard for determining if there is discrimination is two standard deviations, and those numbers are actually three standard deviations. So the numbers are sh were showing us in 1992, discrimination was happening. And clearly where it was happening was, okay, they are applying, but they're not getting in. Right. And knowing, you know, a lot, number of people who were on my search committee, basically, you know, uh, I rising to the top, uh, the question that was asked at the time was, well, why would he want to come here? Because he's overqualified for the job. Mm -hmm. Well, overqualified. Well, so what if I'm overqualified? You know, okay. can I meet, you know, minimums? Can I meet, can I do the essential functions? And exactly. whether I'm overqualified is actually irrelevant, maybe even borderline illegal to even ask that. Can I do the job? That's the only question. You know, that's the only question, but that, the question was asked. And so then the other question was, well, why would he take an $8,000 cut in pay to come work here? Well, again, it's not your concern. Right, exactly. Right? Um, I mean, basically the reason was, you know, to raise a family. So not being a job that I had to travel, you know, globally exactly. with small children. So, yeah, I was willing to take a cut in pay to stay in town. That's right. Essentially. So... Uh, but then running into that situation where you get, um, I can talk about this because again it has been published. So mm -hmm. as an African American in a largely white organization, mm -hmm. you look at, okay, so what's the hiring history, what's the past practice, mm -hmm. right? So if in its 40 some odd year history, Lane has hired less than one African-American per year of its existence. So a total of, say, 33, 34. Mm -hmm. um, and at no time has there ever been more than 12, maybe 15, okay. depending, at any one time. Now I think we're, we're down to six, maybe five, depending on how you count a part-timer. Right. So one of the things that comes in terms of looking at, well, affirmative action deals with protected class folks. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, I mean, the beauty of affirmative action is everybody will qualify at some point in their life, not just minorities and women. Right. You, you, know, you reach 40, you're disabled, you're a veteran, et cetera, et cetera. The net gets wider and wider. Exactly. Um, so one of the things in looking at the rubric of diversity, which is our next question, so there is no legal compliance standard with diversity. With affirmative action, you basically just have to make a good faith effort to reach, I believe it's the 80% rule. Can you talk about that? 80% whole person rule. Yeah. Um, I, won't, I won't go into detail because no, yeah, I, right. I do, but basically, the, um, as I understand it, the 80% whole rule is, well, oh, it's not going to come out now. Yeah. <laughs> is when you have you need to have 80% of the available population mm -hmm. working at your organization mm -hmm. that's the simplest way to say it yeah, right. and um, that is broken down by what they call job groups which yes. is important right. Right. because they look at the skill set pertained within different groups and when you are within that skill set you make a job group mm -hmm. and there's a whole bunch of different ways to determine the job groups which we don't need to talk about right. but you're looking at that job group but that job group can be broken down by department right. all the way down to the nitty-gritty of where is it that we need to focus and improve and look yeah. and that's real the the real analysis of the real experts takes place yeah. Yeah, when, uh, when Donna and I was ha were having this conversation, where essentially there were basically four African Americans on campus. Yeah. Uh, she was saying, okay, so there are two African American faculty in the classroom, mm -hmm. all right? If we were approaching the 80% rule, there would be 25. Mm -hmm. Just based on the amount exactly. of African Americans that are already working nationally, Right. You know, in higher education, and based on, I mean, your hire was actually typical, but your hire was also, I mean, this was a compliance piece for us at the time, was the first time we were actually keeping records. Right. <laughs> for a long, well, which was, it was mentioned to me, it began about then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, then we started putting on in all these steps to try and, you know, because there were a number of things where the typical thing that often happened was... Um, 
I can talk about this as a faculty because I like throwing darts at my particular group for a particular reason. You know, it was almost like we had a compelling business interest to hire white faculty from the U of O exclusively, regardless of what happened in the pool, regardless of people's qualifications. Nepotism was not unknown. You know, illegal hiring practices in terms of, oh, once you get a minority in the pool, you know, you know, sometimes search committees were allowed to actually see the ethnicity of the applicants and screen them out, et cetera, et cetera. We've come a long way, baby, yes. <laughs> from that. We have. Yeah. Um, how does uh, the whole rubric of, since there is no legal compliance standard for diversity, how does that figure into A, your job, or B, your personal philosophy towards the subject of diversity? Because that's different than affirmative action. It is, and it's also different than cultural competency. Yes, we can get it, we'll get so, into that too. So, but before we do, I want to make sure that we're defining diversity in the same way. Yes. So define for me how you see diversity, and let's make sure I'm going to answer that because I see diversity as who I'm surrounded by. I see it by the beauty of the differences of the people that I look in front of me, and it's the seen and then the unseen, and that's where we make the mistake. The unseen diversity is in our religions. It's in our sexual orientation. It's in whether or not we have a mental illness. That's the unseen diversity. The seen diversity is what you see. I'm Anglo. Mm -hmm. That's why this is the Anglo perspective. Mm -hmm. But what I see from sitting from here on diversity relates to my job actually comes from that personal perspective because I traveled a journey to get there. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't come to this place to sit with you and comfortably talk about where I haven't been self-aware and where I have been at my job and be able to do that candidly with committees when we talk about diversity and what we're looking for. Um, you can't travel that journey as a white person without having those periods of aha moments, self-awareness, the zingers. Yeah. And some of them yeah. make you pretty damn embarrassed yeah. with yourself. So in basis of my job, diversity in my job is how I work with my coworkers. It could be at that perspective. It's also the diversity of what I do with myself and my activities within the college. It's where I participate. It's the, the language that I use to express myself. Diversity in my job comes from recognizing that everything about me can be against what I'm looking at and seeing with that I don't see and that I do see. Mm -hmm. That's where it comes in. Everything I do, I'm a human resource analyst. I work in uh, committees. I go from department to department to department. The diversity in our departments is also made up by subject matter. There's an incredible difference in the faculty in science and math and, and when I go to counseling in English literature. Yes. And that's its own type of diversity. That's how it shows up at my job. Does that help a little bit? That, that helps some. Okay, so uh, there's a couple of working definitions, how the college looks at diversity, which is oh, yeah, kind of well, looking yes. at, Policy, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, as an yeah. example, so diversity council concerns itself with, and kind of the episodes of the show line up with, okay, so diversity is not only just race and ethnicity, Excellent. but it could also be sexual orientation, it could also be disability, it could also be social class, exactly. spirituality, religion, okay, and we try and be a welcoming place. Yes. Okay, we look at, uh, so that's how the working definition works for the college. Uh, for specific departments that you know, basically adhere to a cultural competency, culturally competent standard or a culturally proficient standard, mm -hmm. okay? So my alcohol and drug office basically reflects that in alcohol and drug, at least in policy, uh -huh. right? We will consider not only race and ethnicity, class, disability, et cetera, et cetera, but drugs of choice, geography, mm -hmm. you know, country of origin, exactly. you know, social class, level of education, level of literacy. Exactly. You know, all those kinds of things in terms of determining levels of care, treatment, and right. tr exactly. Very treatment so. experiences, right? So a good deal of my work, especially when I'm wearing the AD hat, is looking at all right, it's not just providing a prayer space for, you know, the occasional Muslim student who want, right. you know, play, praying during Ramadan or exactly. the same thing, you know, for an, another, you know, religious group. It also might be looking at uh, dealing with people who are HIV positive. Yes. And, you know, people who are deaf in one ear and, you know, need 
an accommodation in the class or just need a negotiation with a faculty member that's not choosing not to be in compliance with the disability policy and making an accommodation right. for that student or exactly. whatever. And it happens. So, yeah, and it happens. So uh, diversity could mean a lot of different things operationally, and especially when we talk about the issue of cultural competence, which our sister four-year school seems to have, uh, it's a controversial topic. Not that it isn't a controversial topic here, but at least in D Council we talk about it. So, what would cultural competency mean well, for you? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a, a simple answer first. Every single posting that we have has a statement that, uh, that you're held accountable for under what we call essential functions. Mm. And that statement is to model and ensure cultural competency in whatever their work area is. And we define that by acceptance, respect, tolerance, the vision of what we can be mm -hmm. when we all work together. And, the, and in essence, the modeling part for an instructor is that using your example is that the modeling is that they're going to show their students how to deal with that. They're going to make it noticeable. Everything becomes a learner-centered opportunity in the classroom to model it and then to ensure that it's carried out by the people within the sphere that are affected by that because then what happens is we begin to grow as an organization. That's how I see modeling. And an employee that is taking care of the crucial work at the enrollment services desk, if they're not modeling how to talk with and treat that student, that student has just created an atmosphere that they're going to bring to another student, that they're going to bring to a classroom, and it's going to perpetuate what they might already have experienced. So there's not one of us, and of course I think it's obvious that we want the the college administrators from the president on down to demonstrate cultural competency in their language, how they express our policies, how we do, how we make decisions. That's what modeling and ensuring that inclusive vision is. And inclusive is really the key words. Mm -hmm. How does that touch upon my job? I think that I'm hoping my answer accompanied that. How does it touch me as a human being? My son would tell you that he's sick and tired of hearing me talk to people about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a vital thing to my life. It's, it's, it's how I make decisions. Um, over the past 15, probably 20 years, I have very gradually became a changed person when as I learned about diversity and then when I learned about cultural competency and I found I was only competent in areas where I had chosen to be competent. Mm. My perspective your, was... Per, your personal comfort and, zone as it were. Yeah, and I had no idea because, mm. you know, I, it's really important to know one thing. I grew up in a town, uh, the easiest way to say it is my graduating class was 75 people. Mm. Okay. In our town there were two black two black, I mean two black, sorry, there were two um, bisexual relationships, two men, Bobby and Sam, hmm. and another woman, Jackie, whose partner lived in the city. Hmm. My mother worked two jobs. One of those jobs required, brought her in contact. These people were ostracized by this farming, Republican, redneck, I still think for it's being most, bisexual, for right? being bisexual, okay. and, and they could exist, but hmm. they could not interact. Hmm. And it was, and my mother became friends, and they became our family friends. Mm. So I grew up with this woman, Jackie, um, in my tumultuous youth, took me under her wing. And my teenage years were consoled and loved by this woman who I could imagine it was of no issue to me whatsoever. And Bobby and Sam were friends to our family. When my mom went to the hospital, Bobby and Sam were the first people there. Mm. And, and those are the only things I knew. When, and that in past, so I was culturally competent in that area because they had taught me culturally competent. Mm. But in the town I grew up with, there were two black families. Mm. And I was in love with Yvonne, and they had to move. And her, I was telling you this early, her yeah, mom yeah. wouldn't let me iron right. my hair. Right. You don't know what you're getting yourself into, <laughs> honey. <laughs> Wait, can I iron your hair? And <laughs> so they were pressing curl girls. So. Yeah, they okay. were. So right. in any case, back to, the, back to the real story, how that affects me is so, but when I went to college and I walked onto a campus filled with all these races, I was not only not competent, I was terrified. And so I have traveled through the years, through life experiences, management, some of them conscious choices, traveling, 
I have educated myself. I've remained open, and I've continued to have key experiences. As an Anglo person, when I first started at Lane, there's a woman here on staff by the name of Ruth who taught a class about white privilege. Yes, we had her on our, as a guest first season. Yeah, yeah. And, and Ruth and the person she was with, I went to the class because I knew I needed the knowledge. But I went in there and the first one, what the hell does she know? <laughs> <laughs> How about this? And yet I could hear it because it was from her. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I was hearing things that other people in the class were just getting a check mark on a piece of paper for. Yeah. And I, I somehow became proud of being able to hear that. That's a, a huge thing to understand that you're taking pride in understanding others, not for yourself but because you can know you make a difference because of where you work, what you do with your life, because you're a parent. Yeah. And that was a, that's a great example of can trainings be useful in teaching cultural competency? Only if you're ready. Only if you're ready. I and mean, you got the right person to say, have you thought? So that's how it's um, brought me to um, self-cultural competency has turned out to be such a gift in my personal perspective. And you know, I'm constantly given reminders, and I think this is important too. Um, I'm a master's candidate, and um, in my, my roommate is a dear friend of mine, and Marilyn is black, and it's relevant because she says, it is, and you need to know it. <laughs> <laughs> but we're in the car two weekends ago, and we're, we're driving down the road, and she turns to me, she turns out the window, and all of a sudden she starts a wave, and she's going, woohoo, hi, how are you? And I'm like, who are you talking to, Marilyn? And she goes, oh, she's not talking to you, honey, you're white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she's talking to me. Mm -hmm. She goes, you don't, you forget. She mm -hmm. goes, I've never seen a black person in Wilsonville. Uh, <laughs> she goes, when we see each other, we're wondering, what the hell are you doing here? And when right. we see each other, we're going to talk. Right. And she brings me back. Or at to, least the nod. Or at least the nod. She's, she brings me consistently back in that culturally aware moment. I can choose to say, oh, that's funny, and I love you for sharing that with me. Or I can say, I'm forgetting again that I don't have to say hello to the white people I'm driving by. You know why? Because there's so many of us, it doesn't matter. And we drive by in our cars, we never smile, we don't look at each other in the eye, we're terrified to make contact. But the gift that Marilyn has is that no matter where she is, that same greeting, that same collaboration and cohesion that is natural, cultural, I can't attest to. But it's like to such to me, you don't get it. You're white. Isn't you that fair? Well, you I can, can, but she get likes it. to but tease one, me. But one of, things, that, uh, one of the things that she's pointing out, and Ruth would talk about in her class, uh, you know, everywhere I go, I'm white. Right? Yes, that's is, exactly what um, it is. The necessity for things like the nod and greeting, and yes, that's and a also what happens when that doesn't happen, because that doesn't happen with everybody, and. This is one of the places where it doesn't happen. Uh, On Lane, you mean? Lane and Eugene. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that's often difficult here, you know, because, you know, being, you know, quasi-president of, you know, the first and so far only, you know, organization of employees of color at Lane, right, which is actually not unusual in an organization like this at all. Right. Okay, basically it's a national phenomenon. Um, my friend Herman Hope, who came, you know, who's kind of like, uh, he's from Aruba, kind of, Kerba, you know, if there were such a thing for a black Ar Aruban to be called a curmudgeon, he's a curmudgeon. Because, <laughs> you know, he came here as an athlete and, you know, he, uh, he, he likes to make white people uncomfortable, right, mm -hmm. by kind of talking out loud about, kind of everyday stuff. And he has this thing about um, what he calls looking for Kunta Kinte. All right? Uh -huh. So in a place where they're not, I mean, I can walk down the street in Oakland or Los Angeles and pretty much this hairstyle is not even worthy of comment. Right. In an office, anywhere. Corporate, you just don't get a second look. People trip here. That's one part. 
Another part is, you know, the assumptions that are made with, you know, skin color or whatever. But, you know, a lot of black people, you'll, you'll get the nod, hey, what's happening, you know, all that kind of stuff, or you'll get the nod. Herman basically talks about what he calls the looking for Kunta Kinte. Okay? That's what he jokingly refers to. It. He's basically, you're walking down the street, you meet the black, you see a, a, there's another black person, they're coming towards you, and they pretend you're not there. Oh. And they look away. And that's where you're looking for Kunta, they look anywhere but at you, or, you know, uh -huh. they pretend that you don't exist. Uh -huh. Right? And they're, okay. One can understand that. And so that wouldn't happen in the black community. They, what do you, what's the matter? You think, you know, you're better than me right. or whatever? No, you at least make contact. Exactly. Like, okay, we're kind of like, in one sense, in enemy territory here. Because, yes. you know, I mean, when R R the Ruth's workshop, you know, everywhere I'm, I go, I'm white. Well, yeah, well, here I am, a raisin in a sea of buttermilk. And it's okay. kind of like hostile enemy territory, almost. Not necessarily blatant, but yeah. it's there. Yeah. It's subtle. We do um, have it. You know, it, it exists, and so it becomes a uh, kind of a territory to, to negotiate, you know, level of safety. And so, I mean, getting back to sort of like the hiring and all that other kind of piece, and it's a question that I'll ask you a little bit later, but the reason you form a group of people of color in terms of, you know, being in a largely white workplace is like for attempt for mutual support because exactly. the structure of the workplace tends to isolate you. But as an observer, what I hear because I listen is it's it's a, it's it's a danger. It's a danger. It becomes something that I think white people who do not understand the world around them they have this perspective. I think they can be afraid. Just the concept, what's happening. And I think um, it's, it's based on a complete lack of cultural competence or the willingness to ask the question, how does this benefit us? Yeah. That's the single question. Right. But it's so fear-based, and I don't think we know we're in fear. Yeah. Because I, I have had incidences where it's taken a dear friend to ask me, are you in fear? Mm -hmm. Are you, are, what's happening for you? And then you don't always get there right away because, like you said, I, I mean, I grew up in the milk mm -hmm. right over here. Mm -hmm. And we had good cabbage, too. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's what it was like. And, you know, we had talked earlier about training. Mm -hmm. And when I work with the prisoners is what we talked about. And this is a great point. At a local prison. At a local prison, yeah. yeah I, I taught a class about stigma in the workplace. Yeah. And... Um, what, what is important to me there is when I stood up in front of these women, do you know how many people asked me if I was afraid? Yeah. I, I can't even begin to, but they're comorbid, but, but they're this and they're this, and I'm like, but I'm not afraid. Yeah. And they said, well, why aren't Comor you? Okay, so when you say cor comorbid, for they're those of you who are not in social service, it means they have an addiction right. and a mental illness yes. together. Yes, and, and on top of it, they have the stigma of being a felon. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't, see that. I don't see that. And I haven't seen it for years and years and years. And when I try to explain people, they always want to know more. So th the only more that I can give you is in my, I spent some time working um, with individuals from all walks of life yeah. um, in a case management type scenario on a research project about employment. Yeah. And in that case, I learned more about myself and how to work with folks and see them as they are that you really begin to not see these three labels, check mark, check mark, check mark. They've got these three things. What you begin to see or what I see is when I look at that group, I see little people sitting on their shoulders and I call that their human potential. Hmm. And what I see is I don't care that they've done those things as a trainer. My obligation is not to say you're deaf in one ear. My obligation is to say, what do you need to know to reach that potential? And how do I create the right thing to teach you that? Whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a classroom environment. And, and cultural competency without that quality becoming more and more ingrained in everything I do, I would forget to look at the human potential. I remember the first sex offender I worked with. I was terrified all the way to my boots. 
and I'm thinking about my personal history and the attacks I have experienced, and I'm managing what's this. And I'll tell you what, that's the instance that I began to see this mm. rather than this. Mm. And um, The human potential exactly. rather than the threat. In fact, that's what I named my business. My business is named Human Potentials. Mm. Because, okay. you know, the... Uh, I'm a white person in front of a room of 54 people of every possible conglomeration of protected group that you listed earlier mm -hmm. about what this program is. In. And I have to speak to all of them to help them achieve their potential so that they don't have to continue. They can make choices. That's right. what I look at. And my job is to help them choose. Mm -hmm. Here you go. Here's an educate it's, you. It's See, possible like, they mm -hmm. may join our workforce. It is possible. And what happens to them when they come here is mm -hmm. appalling. Right. Because I can tell you people that I, and all of the work life that I've worked with, um, I once worked um, with a person who stalked me. Hmm. And I had to work with that person. And in those years, this is years and years and years ago, while that was worked out and there was no just what I knew, you don't think that I wanted to sabotage her? You don't want to think I wanted to make her life miserable? That's how we feel when we're afraid. And that is the best expression I can give you of stigma towards somebody who is of color, of the stereotype, of the prejudice and the discrimination, is it sits inside of us like this. And we will do it even without knowing we are. And that's what we see here at Lane, at the city of Eugene, in Eugene, at every other city. We see that terror, but we have no expression for it. Well, it becomes interesting trying to get people to see that without so much blaming them. But again, you know, I can understand the stigma piece in terms of you know being afraid of this person. But you know, wait a it's minute. Way more than that. As as a professional, you're still also supposed to serve them. So, as an example, I mean, how it plays out. For example, when I'm doing my drug class, you know, and I mm -hmm. tell a lot of stories because got lots of amazing dope tales. So. Yeah. It's it's not just, you know, uh, the white woman from Oregon who calls up and makes an appointment and says, you know, and then walks in my office and says, oh, you don't look the way you sound over the phone. Yeah. You know, okay, why? I sound taller, right? <laughs> six, <laughs> six foot five and blonde. Okay, sure, right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, you know, we have a little interaction there, but it's also... The four or five skinheads that, are, you know, racist skinheads that I've had to deal with as yes. alcohol and drug clients that are students thing. here, right? So it's like, I'm not worried about them so much. Right. Um, you know, and, but I'm upfront about it. Basically, you know, not, you probably know this, but if you didn't, you know, don't let them show your fear. Right. Don't let them see but your fear. You're also mixing apples and oranges, if I may. But they're both fruits. Yes, they are. But <laughs> one of them is an internal thing. There's the, there's the internal stigma that this woman feels with inside herself the minute she sees you. Yeah. She's thinking, I'm white. He can't help me. And that's her own kind of self-stigma because Patrick Corrigan would say that there's self-stigma and that there's public stigma. Yeah. And the public stigma is everything that we're talking about. But what's, what's happening in our workplaces is let's use someone that has ADHD. Mm -hmm. Their job functioning is slightly different. They can be very off-putting. But they're not going to go around saying I'm ADHD. And they deserve and often get accommodation. But the thing is, is that once the people see them as different, they treat them different, even after this person has normalized. And so this person never quite gets rid of this self-stigma until they get to speak to it, to work it with a counselor like right. yourself, right. till they really begin to bring it out. Their self-shame, their odd behaviors will reappear. They'll come back again in the workplace. And this is, um, you know, I once had someone say to me, well, this is what everybody who's been treated poorly experiences. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's the problem, is that we see you act oddly. We give you a label. We treat you differently. Your skin is different. Your hair is different. I've got to treat you different. External. But inside of you, you're going to perpetuate it even if I stop treating you like that because you haven't dealt with this. Well, unless, you, unless you've done again. the work to deal with that. Right, that's what I'm saying. So it's the counselor that, that comes that's in a, That's another piece in terms when we look at... Um, all right, so 16 years ago, 
uh, they see this guy that, you know, okay, this black guy that's overqualified for this drug counseling job, you know, and okay, yeah, overqualified, but, you know, all right, you gave me a shot, $8,000 cut and pay, yada, yada, right? So what do I bring to the office? And then what do the other folks bring to, That's what I'm talking to about. the workforce? Because exactly. one of the things when we're talking about cultural competency, I do not have the option exactly. ever of being culturally incompetent with white people. Ever. Ever. I agree. Ever. <laughs> right? Ever. And a Neither wide degree material. of white people. You know, even if they don't like me racially. And so when I'm dealing with the skinheads, I say, you know, my only fear with you. You know, because I, you know, I came from L.A., I dealt with gangs. You know, that, you know, I was out, my job was outreach to gangs. So, you know, I don't trip about you. My only, thing, my only fear with you is that you won't hear what I have to say for you, even though it is the scientific truth, okay? You got to stop drinking 40s, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> you got to stop that because it's unhealthy for you as evidenced by... You know, you getting gang raped by your fellow white supremacists and That's then okay. left, you know, under a bridge somewhere. Right. Okay? And now I got to tell you, yo, you got to, in three months, get HIV tested. All right? Now, you're going to have trouble hearing that <laughs> right, right off the top. Exactly what And I'm now you're going to have exactly. trouble hearing it with, from a black guy with a California newscaster English accent. Exactly, exactly. Um, but but here, here's the thing that you got to do. So when I bring a multicultural focus to my office where it didn't exist with the white guy right. beforehand because cultural competency was not an expectation of this organization, oh, of all. that fair-haired boy, their language, I didn't call them that, that's the, that's the language they used <laughs> so for my predecessor, <laughs> fair-haired boy. Oh, he was the fair-haired boy. He could do no wrong. Well... Okay, well, that, that didn't happen. So for me, it's not so much wanting to hire somebody who's black simply because they're black, right. but because of the cultural capabilities that a person who's been working for white organizations has had to practice in those organizations, yes. a higher standard of cultural competency potentially, and being able to look for that. But it's important to interject that you have the education to be able to articulate and practice this. Unfortunately, though, this did not come, whatever education I got did not come no. from a classroom. No, but I'm saying I'm working with people that don't have that depth of understanding to be able to clarify it, as you've just stated. And as a white woman working with them, they're at a disadvantage with me because of that. Mm. Because I can help them with a whole series of things. But can I honestly sit down on the other side of the table and provide what they need when the difference of race and ethnicity is a barrier that I can't quite learn? You understand pain. Yes, and I do it from that perspective. Okay. But I still feel that there is a slight difference that I need to always be aware of that I need to remain cognizant of to benefit the people I work with. And that's what I think we need all social service mm -hmm. people to remember is we're still getting a paycheck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we might have been there. I lost my home. I was without everything. I was homeless. I know that experience. I can teach that experience. Yeah. But I'm not still living it. Mm -hmm. You know, what it becomes is a role modeling experience that's very useful in a training. Or at least being able to point them towards role models that fit their particular yeah. demographic because at this point there's lots of them to do that. So anyway, I, I don't know, but I, I think we're, I think as an organization to bring us back to that, I think Lane really does believe and is working toward something that didn't exist in 1992. Mm -hmm. And I think both of us can talk to people, or you might know better, or I can hear about companies from the people I work with, that it's nowhere near as close, and they're still in the 1950s. And when, if then. If then. 
and then you know and then if you there's no comparing stigmas but you know I'm very focused on the mentally ill being in the workplace we don't talk about that here at Lane no we didn't talk about that at the last company I worked at we didn't talk about we don't want to talk about the stigma of somebody having depression difficulty doing their jobs we don't want to we don't want to learn what to do with that student in our classroom when they begin to act out. And if you look at the police incidences that David Oakes was talking about, mm -hmm. he did a great job explaining that. When you look at those things, it's more and more examples that we really haven't got that much cultural competency going around all of these areas. Well, that's true. Around all because, of these areas. Because, you know, one of the things that it requires to do, you know, as one of my lunch companions today was talking about is you really have to be able to feel the pain of the boot or at least empathize with the pain that mm -hmm. somebody else is going through and openly talk about it and acknowledge it. Now, it's actually part of my job description to do that and deal with people's pain yeah. as well as my own and still, you know, be able to function and, you know, guide them through a particular thing and, you know, but you're right about, you know, various types of stigma. So, when you look at phenomena of stigma in the workplace, what do you do, whether it's within your job or not? Because now we're kind of way beyond your strategy. job description. What strategy. is the strategy? Um, the strategy varies a little bit, but in essence, there's three key pieces. And you're going to, it, it may not sound logical, but it's this I believe in you, I care about you, and together we can make a difference here. That's all that's needed, those three things. The rest of it are practical strategies that I or anybody else can teach you. When we bring somebody into Lane, we owe them those three things. And the humanity of an organization is not found in bickering over how large my office is or what kind of paper do I get to print my stuff on. You know, I, it's, it's not found there, the humanity. Or what do I have to give up? You know, I mean, that's one of the things the lunch partner was talking about. It's like a zero-sum game. What do I have to give up to concede that's this to you? That's what I'm trying to yeah, say. Right. But in reality, it's this, those three things. And then I can go through a host of strategies, anything from desk place strategies, reminders. What does a paperclip do? A paperclip holds things together. When you look at that paperclip and you're having a moment, you hold on to that, and you remember that you're holding together like a paperclip. I have thousands of those things. Mm. And it's what, what we teach, and it's providing a place to go to, and it's making sure that somebody is saying, yeah, you go to a counselor and they give you a plan. Yeah, that's really great. But who's going to say, do you want to walk with me for 10 minutes today? You know, what we offer at Lane through a wellness program, that's the heartbeat of dealing with mental illness. No organization does. And the health clinic, we are in an ideal place to take care of the people that we have here and open up one more avenue, which is the avenue of education of how to care for yourself and your daily efforts on your job when your coworkers, once again, stand outside your cube and go to lunch and talk about lunch and go there and Without never you. say yeah. a word to you. Yeah. So that's, that's really, it's education of the staff and it's teaching you to have that self-care plan and how to do it. Um, that's cultural competency. If we were all aware of our coworkers at that three-level thing, I don't think we'd have a cultural competency issue. I believe you, I care about you, and we're in this together. What else is there? How can I help? Exactly. So that's so, what I have to offer. Okay. So any other thoughts on uh, how cultural competence uh, plays into your daily awareness and other training with? Only that every day that I remember that I'm just as special as everybody else and all the odd things about me, <laughs> which might not be so visible to other people, um, all of my beliefs that might not directly fit into my workplace, to my team, all of my way of speaking, your way of speaking, and the same things for everybody else. It, it, I can role model that because I'm in a position of power, both in w expressing our view of Lane to the public and as myself in my individual life. And that's really where it is. I happen to be white. How dare I waste that and not benefit other people? 
I know that sounds cocky. Do you understand well, what I'm trying to say? No, that's good. You know, I mean, understanding I you know the whole phenomenon of privilege and that you have power and what are the elements of that power and how can you... Well, people give it to me even if I don't want it. Right, right. That's the problem. Mm, yes, yeah. And so I have to decide to use that for others or to use that to advance my personal belief. Yeah. So um, let's see. In the few couple of minutes that we have left, um, how can people be an ally in whatever situation? An ally for cultural competency? Yes. They all need to go to Ruth's class. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? An ally, if it was me, I would, we had talked about this in another realm. I'd be asking people to attend the council mm. the, here at Lane to the attend council. the council. Yeah. I'd be asking them to attend the council and ask questions. And stop talking about it behind the scenes. Let's bring it to the table in an intelligent, non-rhetorical, clear question, clear answer discussion. As that, clear as we can. Because as you were talking about before, at least, you know, at least for folks at Lane, you know, D Council is the place where the conversations right. happen on a regular basis. And I, and, and I don't think making a website or doing all that, I don't think that works. There's a limit to There's a limit to its effectiveness. But um, I only think that we are... Um, always forgetting that we're all in this together and that to spread cultural competency we have to be willing to say I'm not culturally competent but I'm willing to learn but I'm willing to learn so we'll have to leave it there um, thank you Lynn Marie for You're coming welcome. on such You're short welcome. notice this has been a great I'm show glad. I'm glad uh, Tune, this has been uh, Diversity TV. If you have uh, feedback, you can email it to liveclass at lanecc.edu. Uh, tune in next week. We will have uh, an African-American perspective, someone from the community, or a at least a history piece. Tell a friend about the show uh, if you like what you see, and uh, we are, we're always good for feedback. Thank you, and go well, stay well.